Hello gamers and welcome back to another episode of Solo Spelunky. And uh, today I want to start my Star Wars powered by Shadow Dark, namely Star Dark series. I will not call it a campaign because it'll be a, a series. So my I decided that I will call my sessions not sessions but episodes because my my focus is just to play around a little in this sector and just do like little uh, one or two session or episode adventures um yeah nothing special um but before i start i would like to to ramble a little bit about the the background of this series and for those of you who do not want to listen to my rambling I will of course put a link or not of course I will put uh, not a link but the timestamp for when the actual gameplay starts I will put this into the video description just as I did in my last video when I created the sector for this series. Um, yeah, but before I get into the background, uh, something else. I hope that uh, my my camera um, shakiness is somewhat reduced now because I invested heavily in the channel because I know that I will be rich beyond my dreams pretty soon. So I bought a professional um, smartphone stand that has like a, a retractable and movable arm that is securely attached to the side of the table and it even comes with a ring light so uh, also the lightning should be better um, and also the the shakiness of the camera uh, whenever I do stuff on the table should be well probably not really gone because the arm is also attached to the table and if i like throw dice around and put them on the table and 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 just move around of course this will also translate to the mountain or to the mounting but i think to a lesser extent than it did before when i was just using my selfie stick so you should notice some improved production quality if you want to call it that uh, hopefully in my future videos yeah so that's that and now um yeah what is the background or, or why will this series be special to me in in some way because it will be um yeah basically a trip down memory lane and um i will elaborate on that because um yeah, short while ago, thanks to WhatsApp and uh, the internet, um, I got in contact again with an old friend of mine and um, a female friend, and we, um, yeah, we got to know each other twenty years ago uh, over a um, online role-playing game, and that was Ultima Online, and. Um, I don't know if you remember or know this game. This was one of the first um, multiplayer online games and it had like yeah, isometric 3D graphics and we were playing this on a non-commercial free chart. So back in the day there was this server emulating software available and people, they could make their own Ultima online servers and they were called charts, if you will. And this was a, a RP, heavy RP focused chart where you had to apply as a player and, and, and write a little backstory to your character and, and lay out in an essay uh, what, uh, what is important for you during role play and, and stuff. And then the administrators, they decided based on your character backstory and your essay, um, if you were admitted to the server. And this was like a pretty RP story heavy server. And the events in game, they were accompanied also by uh, in-game 
po or, or in character posts on a related forum that existed for the shard and i've played this pretty heavily i think for about three years and then i decided to to um go cold turkey seriously because um if we're talking about about online addiction here and and i've seen reports about people playing um what uh, warcraft that was also came out in the early 2000s um pretty heavily and extensively that indeed you develop some sort of or, or your brain develops some sort of, of, of um, responses that also an addict um, um, creates basically and and this is actually what what I noticed that I was focused so heavily on this game at times and depending on the in-game events that um, yeah basically I didn't really focus anymore on, on real life. So this was actually not, it was, for me, it became an, to an extent where I, for me, decided it is not good anymore. And that was the time when I was about to, 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 to finish my, my studies and I had to prepare for exams. And um, so I decided to, to go cold turkey, really, and uninstalled the whole thing. And back in the day, it was not as easy as it is today, where you just install stuff. The internet was in its infancy and we had a very slow connection and, and you had to patch up the game back to the newest version. So it was a complicated process. You couldn't just reinstall the game and, and start playing so this is when why and when i stopped playing this game but during my time playing this game um we also like all the people that that played this game we also met in in real life basically whenever there was some some sort of event like a at a convention like a pen and paper convention or something um we would meet up and we were located pretty um yeah or spread out pretty evenly across Germany. So we would meet at, at a people's house and, and then we would then have a sleepover, just like uh, sleeping bags on the floor, nothing fancy. And we would like talk and play games and also visit conventions. So this is um, how we got to, to know each other. And um, yeah, pretty soon we also started to play a Star Wars campaign. And that was a one-on-one -on -one campaign. It was me as the GM, but I also played uh, an important non-player character that accompanied the PC. And my friend and she played a, um, yeah, a female elf-like character. It was um, a race and a culture that she came up with, basically a mixture of classic fantasy elves and a little drow in space and that blended technology and and nature and they were force sensitive by by design by birth but they were not jedi they they lived pretty secluded but i will go into this um, a little bit further uh, in a moment just to continue and we played um this yeah one-on-one -on -one, today you would probably say duet campaign and we played it for on and off because we we lived in different cities so every once in a while we would meet uh, and then we would play sometimes we would play via um, icq that was i think there was no discord back in the day however um and we played the the d20 version and the 3.x based version not saga edition and her character she got up to level i think like 10 or 12 so she became pretty powerful and over the years she had like a sheet full with contacts contact sheet that she acquired in game and she had some unique items that she got in game for completing quests. Like um, for those of you familiar with the Western games system, there was a book out, The Planets Collection. And there was a system called Coin. And there was an honorable warrior race there, the Coinites. And they were, I think, loosely modeled after um, after Klingons. And, and they had a unique armor 
Coinit Battle Armor. It was made out of uh, a coin native plant, sort of like very hard wood. So it was very lightweight, but also pretty good. It gave you a plus 2D to resist energy damage. So that's like 1D better than what you would normally get in this system. And it would still only impose a, a minus 1D dexterity penalty. So that was pretty neat armor and you couldn't find it outside of coin and it was like the unique thing to the coin needs. And because of a quest she completed, and I don't remember the exact details, like for example, she had this custom made coin need battle armor for her character. So those were those little unique things that developed um, over the years. And recently, um, we got in contact again pretty loosely over WhatsApp and she sent me a file with her character's backstory that she wrote like 20 years ago. So this must have been like a 20 year old file or 22 or 23 year old, I don't know. And and I was amazed that she still had it and that the, the disk drive or whatever where she had it on, maybe it was on the cloud, I don't know, was still working because I certainly, and I regret this sometimes, do not have any notes that I made 20 years ago. I, I think I've changed like like PCs like three times or so in this, in this uh, time frame. So uh, I was pretty amazed that she still had this old file and it was like a three or four page, very detailed, backstory of the culture, the planet, but also her character. And when I was, or while I was reading this backstory, a lot, lot of these memories came back to those times when we were young and carefree and uh, had basically, besides our studies and then like work training, had like, it felt like an unlimited amount of free time, um, at least a lot more, than when you are a parent. Um, so, and, and a lot of these memories came back. So I decided I would like to, to play this series sort of as a tribute to this one-on-one -on -one campaign we did 20 years ago. So the characters that will appear in this series will be of course modeled after the characters that we, and I say we because my, my NPC companion that I played as a GM, he was almost like a player character. So I was filling two roles at this time. I was the GM, but I also controlled a companion character, uh, which was of course a smuggler and scoundrel. And um, his name then, or back then, was um, Manu Korbeck. And you probably remember him from, because this is his Star Wars miniature sheet, Manu Korbeck Scoundrel. Um, and this was his miniature, because I played him also in this mini scenario that I played on this channel as well. So that was the, the NPC player hybrid scoundrel Manu Korbeck that I played back in the day. And I'm not going to reveal the name of her character because I don't know if she um, would mind if someone maybe identifies her, but I don't know, maybe because of what I was elaborating, maybe some people do, but um, yeah, I digress. Um, so I'm not, uh, but, um, but the, and this time of course, um, the roles will be sort of now yeah, reversed because now of course the focus I will be playing the scoundrel character but it is not Marnu Korbeck because there's only one Marnu Korbeck it'll be Nash Duncan which is also one of my standard scoundrel names but he will be sort of modeled after Marnu Korbeck and there will also be um, an NPC PC so it's a player character that I of course also control but I do not have, if you will, full control, like, for example, the equipment, the funds that this other character modeled after her character has, I cannot freely use it to buy stuff for Nash Duncan, for example. So this will still be, be separated. Um, 
but I will control both characters and um, yeah and this will be sort of like a tribute to to this campaign we played over years over 20 years ago so this is why um, yeah I, I came up with this idea the initial trigger was like reading this 20 year old backstory and um, yeah and I really um, also liked the culture that she introduced back then and um, yeah and I want to introduce it into this series and that's the good thing about Star Wars the galaxy is vast there's uh, the outer rim and the unknown regions are vast and unexplored and there's basically room for yeah almost everything in the Star Wars universe and with that I will first or start by introducing this culture and this race um, that I was talking about that the NPC player character in this series will be from in a little more detail. So the race they're called Eldridians and they hail from the planet Eldrid. Who would have thought about that? And the Eldridians they are a mixture of classic fantasy elves and the closest would be wood elves but also a little bit drow drow because they have a and now i don't know if i uh, pronounce this right they have a matriarchal society is that what it's called when the women are basically in charge so uh, just like in the drow culture but also in the amazon um, culture um, the women are basically in charge so um, the women run things there's a council of elders that watch over the the fate of the Eldridian people and I will uh, get to that and they have um, an elite order of warriors the shadow hunters and those are exclusively women so they're basically shadow huntresses and and they are the protectors and the eyes and the ears and the operatives of this elder council that consists of very old and ancient Eldridian women. So this brings us to the next subject. Uh, long is it called longevity? So when you so Eldridians they they can live to about I think five or six hundred years so five or six centuries and um, so they're long-lived just like I think Wookiees are as well and they also like Wookiees um, live or the planet they live on is a planet with a layered ecosystem so the dominant terrain are dense woods out of huge trees just like the washer trees on Kashyyyk so they are huge and they're as a matter of fact they're huge so that the the small basically um, offspring of the thick branches are almost like woods in themselves and the Eldridians they have formed a symbiotic bond with nature they have blended nature and technology and they are by design by birth force sensitive force sensitive but they use the force a little bit differently than jedi so they use it to to affect to form nature and so they focus basically on the sense and the control or I call it a channel in Stardark but for co maybe copyright reasons but it is alter sense and control are if you look at Star Wars are the three main force disciplines so they rather focus on control and sense so they use the force to enhance their own abilities their senses their combat prowess so that would be the control aspect but they also use the sense aspect to sense their surroundings and um, a little bit of alter to form nature 
to accom accommodate like their cities and uh, and to blend it with technology. So and and these shadow huntresses, they are yeah also like a religious or or disciplined order, where you also have to undergo a training and then you have to pass a trial. And when you pass these trials, you are officially a shadow huntress. And then you are at the disposal of the council of elders that will send you on missions. And, and this layered ecosystem of Eldred is just like a chic, um, constructed in a way that the further down you go, the more dangerous it gets. And only very few people, if any, have ever ventured to the surface of the planet. And to um, give you a little atmosphere, I created some images. And so let's, I gotta check the glare here. So this is the planet Eldred as you would see it from space. So there are deep blue and large oceans with wonderful beaches. But the rest of the planet is covered or the land masses are covered in these huge planet spanning woods that um yeah that um make up the majority or or the entirety of the planet here so this does not fit exactly the description but here we we have a glimpse of of these large huge trees and um, and the Eldridian cities, of course, you can't see it on the picture, but they're like like the Evoc tree village, but more modern, and they're blended and constructed around and within these large trees and forests. So that is the planet Eldred, and I may I had some make some I made some more pictures. So this is also here you can see the surface. So this is also um, um, you can see these huge trees. So this actually looks pretty nice. You have to imagine this a little bit darker, of course, and, and more dangerous. And here we have another image that shows these these huge trees so that you can get a little idea. So that is the planet Eldrid, home of the Eldridians. And what is also important is, yeah, the, of course, like I said, there are, they are force sensitive by nature. So the empire naturally would have a strong interest probably in these people and this planet and the culture. So, um, they are the Eldridians, they, they stick to themselves. So their planet is located deep in the outer rim at the far reaches at the edge or border to the un, um, uh, what is the unknown regions. That's what they're called, the unknown regions. So totally off the way and almost all of the galaxy is unaware of the Eldridian existence and the planet Eldrid. Of course, the Shadow Huntresses, they do go out on missions because they're the operatives of the Council of Elders and they have to keep tabs on what is going on in the galaxy. And the Council of Elders and the Shadow Huntresses they're also charged with protecting the secret of the Eldridian culture and the planet Eldrid. So um, whenever every once in a while someone might run into an Eldridian, usually a female, because the males, the females are the ones that do the shadow huntress stuff and the, the fighting and the martial stuff and the protecting. And the men, they are like the craftspersons or craftsmen and, and, uh, yeah, and all the other stuff. So they're 
artisans, their teachers, their craftsmen, um, but they're usually not warriors. So this is, I think, a little bit different than in Drow society because they're also the males are warriors, but the women, they run things. But here it is different. You would rarely, if ever, encounter an Eldridian male someplace in the galaxy. Rather, a female on a mission, on a secret mission usually, um, for the council of elders. And yeah, if they should get captured or whatever, um, they, yeah, they would rather kill them th themselves than to give up the secret of their planet's location and existence. So, and this brings us to the topic of weapons and armor. And just like the Koinids, the Eldridians, they have merged nature and technology. So they also have, of course, discovered the, or they are on the level of, or their technology level is that of space. So they have discovered hyperspace travel, interstellar travel. They built starships, but very, very few, only for scientific purposes with small crews or little craft for the shadow huntresses um, to go about their business. But usually, and this is important for the campaign, um, they're dropped off someplace and then, um, yeah, and then acquire transport of their own because we they don't want to, to risk any so like for example if this eldridian starship would fall into the wrong hands that would be pretty bad because then they would get a look at this unique eldridian technology and maybe from the star shards could decipher the location so they're usually dropped off and from there on they're on their own to accomplish their mission to to hire passage or use normal starships um standard starships whatever so um but they do have discovered the the hyperspace, um, the technology of hyperspace, and um, and uh, they have blended, yeah, technology with nature. So, um, in game purposes, and I will introduce these char the characters. Um, this um, female, and she will be called Raya. Um, she is a wielder, so the wielder class, but they don't use lightsabers in the classic Jedi sense. I call the weapon they use force blades and you can imagine these weapons a little bit modeled like the dark saber. So the hilt actually looks like an actual sword hilt but it is a very like the hilt is made out of very hard and polished wood from an Eldridian tree crafted very exquisitely with elongated lines and there's an, an, an inlay where like this metal part with the power cell and the projector and everything is like inserted in this wooden handle and the, the wrist guard is formed as a silver leaf and the blade that is projected looks like a real like like the the dark saber also not really looks like a lightsaber but like a real bladed sworded weapon and this is how these force blades look like so on the belt they're just like a finely crafted wooden sword handle with metal inlays and when they're ignited they look like a dark saber but rias will have a purple color and this is also because the miniature I use for her will be this miniature and this is Mara Jade Skywalker I just painted her hair and she has a purplish lightsaber and this is like the only miniature that I have that I think is fitting um, for Raya so this is why her her blade will be purple um, yeah so that's basically the background, the setup. And yeah, I wanted to give you a little insight in, in this campaign and, and why I, or in this series and why I decided to, 
to um, start this now and, and why in this constellation. And it is important um, to get a little background before that. So let's get to the important part, characters. So my character is Nash Duncan and I created him using my heroic uh, character creation rules that I made up for Shadow Dark which means you get 116 set that you can place in whatever ability you would like. I have decided to place it in Wisdom because I like it that if he, that he has sharp senses, a good intuition. And uh, if you read my Stardock rule set, it also helps with piloting. Uh, I didn't want to go the usual dex route and you will see in a moment why and, and, and why this doesn't really affect me much in this case and so and the other I wrote 3d6 down the line with the caveat that everything below 11 is automatically raised to 11 and I cannot overstate this you will not find below average adventurers in my games so he's got strength 11 Dexterity 11, Constitution I got lucky 14, Intelligence I got lucky 14, Wisdom I placed 16 and Charisma again 11. The class is, he's a scoundrel, he's a human, his name is Nash Duncan, he is neutral, his background, and I chose this, is a gambler, he can't keep his hands off dice and cards, his deity is money, he is level 1. And by my heroic rules, you get maximum hit points at first level. So he's got eight hit points, six plus at first level and only at first level in Shadow Dark, you add constitution. So he's got eight hit points and he's got an AC of 15. So now why 15? Um, because I decided at least for defense uh, in character combat, I will go the same route as in Starship combat that you could use either dexterity, intelligence or wisdom to add to your armor class. Because I don't want everybody to be a dex monkey to be effective in combat, but this is only for defense. For ranged attacks, you can see here plus zero, you still use your dexterity modifier, which is plus zero in my case. So I got a, an AC because I used Wisdom of 13 and I have Light Armor integrated into my leather jacket, um, which gives me a, dex, uh, a base AC of 12. So this is why I get to AC 15. And this also corresponds to fourth edition, where you could, at least not for armor class, but for reflex defense, you also had the choice of using either your dexterity or, for example, your intelligence modifier. So, um, so I decided to go this route because it's my game and I can do whatever I want. So, scound and now uh, I got friends in low places. That's the class feature. Uh, I got expert knowledge and here I chose my usual silver tongue because I'm a people person. And then for my two talent rolls, because I'm a human, I rolled ranged or melee damage. My choice, I chose range damage plus one. And for my other talent roll, I got another instance of scoundrel's luck, meaning I can have up to two luck tokens. And when I finish a successful rest, my luck tokens refresh to two. Um, yeah, I was lucky with my money. I had 2,100 credits to spend, but um, uh, that was enough for light armor, which is integrated into my leather jacket to get a blaster pistol, a compad. I got two energy cells and I have only 100 credits left. So I'm in desperate need of money as usual. And um, yeah, and this is why I'm also for hire, if you will. And um, I have, I do have a starship. But a very, so this is my starship. It is the versatile rust bucket. It is Nash Duncan starship and it is an old Corellian engineering YR-1080 light freighter. And there is uh, no equivalent in canon to that. I just, I completely made this up. So this is a predecessor of the YT-1300 and or the successful YT line of freighters. Um, it is just a very basic ship. It's got 20 hull for sublight speed, handling plus zero, shields none, a slow hyperdrive times 2.5 instead of the standard type 
times two what usually these of the rig freighters have it only has a top mounted light laser cannon turreted that only deals 1d4 points of damage um plus one fire control if manned from the turret, plus zero if fired from the cockpit. It can accommodate four passengers. It has a cargo capacity of 100 metric tons, supplies for one month, and it can be flown by a crew of one to two um, people. And the AC is the basic 10, plus handling zero, plus shield zero, and then plus either the pilot's Dexterity, Intelligence or Wisdom modifier. Of course, I choose Wisdom. So the AC of this ship is 13. It's not marked on here because it might change depending on modifications and stat increases. So this is um, Nash Duncan's Starship. The versatile rust bucket. Pretty basic, but he owns it. No debt attached to it, but he only has got... 100 credits in his pocket all right and to get an idea of nash duncan that is him my standard male star wars type scoundrel um so this will be nash duncan and it somewhat fits also the miniature and um, I will not reveal the picture of Raya until we encounter her. So, um, and I will also not reveal her character sheet until it becomes important and we encounter her. So that was a lot of um, rambling, a lot of background, but I think it is important that you get the, the context of this adventure. And now I think we will just start. So, um, yeah, I will, I will put a timestamp here. So this is where the gameplay starts, but I would strongly advise you to still listen to my rambling before because it gives a detailed insight into an important part of this series. So now that we have this out of the way, I have decided, and I didn't roll this randomly, I decided it for story purposes, that I will start my Adventure, my first adventure in this series called Adventures in the Keldor Sector in the Calcareous System. And the Calcareous System, we have established that, is a wretched hive of scum and villainy controlled by the uh, Hut Cartel. It is close to Hut Space and there is a constant crime war going on with the criminal factions of the Peron System which is the other wretched hive of scum and villainy. And um, let's, like Star Wars planets are a little bit different than our planets. You usually only have like a few cities and, and pockets of civilization, if you will. So um, let's roll how many cities and it is 1d3 plus 1. 1d3, uh, so 1 two, three, four, that is two, that is three major cities, Kelkaris, so I put down Kelkaris, three major cities. And usually when it comes to city names, I make it, um, I make it not hard on myself. Um, the capital or main city is, is usually called system name and then prime or central or whatever and so i am in calcaris prime that is the planet's capital and to make it easy capital city also the only starport on the planet And my ship is docked there. And um, now I dropped my cap, just a second. Um, 
my ship is docked there and let's see how many inhabitants it is 1d6 times 500,000 so that we get a, a feel oh um, that's a six yeah that's a six uh, so that is three million people three million inhabitants but um, Kerkaris Prime but it is not and this is important because everybody thinks like when Star Wars cities are these huge like Narshada layered cities no this is a one level city which stretches out over a large area I mean three million people I don't know think I don't know two boroughs or one of, of New York City whatever so imagine you have um, avenues and roads small alleyways you have large buildings skyscrapers with little buildings in between so it's just a normal um, grown um, earth-like major city so no no layered ecosystem here um, like in Narshada, Coruscant etc. Coruscant so I just put down normal city And yeah, this is where I am and I only have 100 credits to my name and I'm desperately looking for, for no, no, not desperately looking for work. And I put this, this image here just for the atmosphere. So of my character and um, yeah, because I'm a gambler, I'm heading towards a casino, of course, because I know I can only... Of course, I can only double my um, my 100 credits. It is uh, it is late. It is uh, 2200 hours, so it is night. So the city, um, yeah, is rough all the time because it's a wretched hive of scum and villainy. But at night, it might be even rougher. And what I also did, um, I created some pictures for generic game situations for atmosphere. And I have to see if this works with the ring light. Uh, sadly not. Let's see if I, uh, because of the reflectiveness. So I don't know if you can see it. Um, uh, but I didn't want to print everything out. So this is like the street level picture that you can see let me get this a little closer um yeah that's the bad thing about this ring light here um yeah so it is um i gotta find a different solution for that so um put this away maybe i if i turn off the ring light while i show the pictures i don't know so if any of you have experience how to use these reflective surfaces with ring lights please let me know in the comments um yeah so i'm at the street level uh, in a smaller it's not a dark alley but it's a smaller road and um there are different gambling dens and parlors and cantinas on this road it's sort of like the amusement district and i'm just about or i want to um enter a casino or head towards a casino as suddenly A figure steps out of the shadows from a side alley and I can see this graceful almost cat-like movement this figure from her statue I assume it's a female it's a woman wears a hooded cloak the cloak is pulled into her face but out of the darkness of the cloak I can see two blue glowing eyes and a voice addresses me you are Nesh Duncan right and I am immediately alerted I shift my stance and my hand 
they are not reaches, but I move my hand so that it hovers over my blaster. As the woman says, reach for that and you're dead on the ground before you know it. I just want to talk. And I'm like, well, I'm listening. But I usually don't react well to strangers approaching me without announcing their presence first and appearing just out of nowhere, out of the dark. Well, deal with it. I have a job proposal for you. I'm listening, but I'm also curious. Why me? I don't remember, or I would remember it if I would have dealt with you before. <laughs> and I smile and try to make a, a wise-ass, wise-cracking joke. There's something about those eyes of yours. <laughs> I think I would remember them. There's no reaction. The woman, she steps a little further out of the shadows into the light. And now I can get a glimpse or a closer glimpse of her. Da -da -da -dum -da -da. And this is her. This is Raya, a Dridian shadow huntress. So the, the figure, I see the woman, she moves like with an un Unprecedented, is that what you call it, if you haven't seen this, this kind of movement before? Like with an unprecedented grace and agility. And she wears, I think it is, and I'm thinking like in, in character now a little, I think it is some sort of armor, but it almost appears as if it hugs her body. So she wears, so in game terms, this is, I call this... Um, Leaf skin armor, that's what I call it. Uh, let's check this. Yeah, leaf skin armor. So it is basically also light, light armor. It is like a leathery um, a mixture of leather and synthetic suit with, with leaf like structure and shifting plates that also absorb um, light a little bit. And um, it looks rather unique. And I have never seen such armor before. And this woman, she has like pale or, or light white skin, those glowing or glowing blue eyes and fine features almost like a statue. And her hooded cloak looks rather new and... Um, yeah, and out of this hooded cloak and out of this statue-like, yeah, um, beautiful face, these blue glowing eyes stare at me. And um, I don't really see any weapons on her, just like, uh, just like on her belt, there is sort of like it looks like a sword handle very finely crafted but the sword is missing strange so this woman steps out of the shadows let's just say you were recommended to me looks like you have had some or you have some loyal customers that you maybe worked for in the past that recommended or suggested that I would talk to you. So here I am. Well, that's quite an impressive feat, tracking me down just like that. If you say so. I don't know what is impressive to you humans or what your standards are. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, okay. So um, I'm all ears if it, if it comes to business. Um, if you are so well informed, <laughs> I try to, to, to smile a little bit again, but she seems utterly unimpressed. Um, I'm also a little bit short on cash at the moment. So I'm thankful for every, um, yeah, every opportunity to make some credits. So do you want to talk business here or can I use some of my last credits to, to offer you a drink and to invite you to a drink? I would be pleased uh, if, um, and my, my eyes just wander and I just see if I can find like the next cantina and there's one at the corner and, uh, it is the uh, the watering hole. Um, if we can just have a drink right there. I, I've been there in the past. It's a nice place. That is, of course, a lie. And so why don't we talk business in there in private? And she just goes, lead the way. That is her, <laughs> probably her way of telling me that she agrees. So, um... Yeah, I lead the way. Uh, so we have entered this cantina, watering hole. And we look for a booth. And uh, not watering booth, watering hole to sit down. And uh, we find one. We sit down. And um, do you have any a favorite? Just ask her and she just goes water uh water yeah you're all business no fun huh and she doesn't doesn't react at all and yeah so i order um an ale and a water and um how about some snacks they have probably nice fries here or finger food I've already eaten, thank you. Uh, okay, but um, you mind if I have a burger? You can do whatever you want, as long as you're still able to listen. <laughs> yeah, all right, a and one burger, please. All right, and then she starts talking. It is a very simple, very straightforward mission. I need you to fly me to a pair of coordinates at the edge of the Keldor Nebula. There we will probably find a spaceship. It is either there at these coordinates or it is some place in that area. Because this spaceship is a derelict vessel, it's adrift. So it couldn't have come pretty far or gone very far from these coordinates. I need to board this vessel and I need to retrieve an important item. And afterwards, I will destroy this vessel. And once I have completed my task, you will drop me off back here. That's it. Basically a simple, basically a simple taxi driver mission. <laughs> All right. Well, it might sound simple to someone who has not done a lot of space travel, obviously. So let me give you or fill you in in a few details. First of all, traveling through hyperspace ain't like dusting crops. Without precise calculations, we could fly right into a star or into a supernova and this will end your mission real quick. So the thing is that there is no known hyperspace route or lane from here towards the edge of the Keldor Nebula. So the first difficulty will be that we will need to calculate our own hyperspace route, which is a very 
delicate process and it also comes with certain risks. Second, this Caldor Nebula wreaks havoc with ship systems. It is corrosive, it interferes with your scanning equipment and who knows what else it might do to your ship. I probably need extensive uh, maintenance afterwards. Um, so that is also something I have to consider when it comes to payment. So um, let's talk numbers. What is it you are offering? 5,000 credits. All right, so 5,000 credits, now a little OOC. So actually, that sounds pretty good for, for such a taxi job. But uh, of course, I also, um, I also want to get a little more out of it. All right, so 5,000 credits. I think is a good start. Let's say if it's just the nebula, fly there, get something, even though it's close to the nebula and fly back. That is something I would do for 5,000. But the elephant in the room is of course the hyperspace calculations, the hyperspace route. So um, because of the risk I'm taking, um, and the danger to my ship, I would have to insist on another 2,500. Make it 7,500. All right, so now here I'm going to make a roll and um, I will not make a, like a, an opposed roll. I just will set a difficulty and taking into account um, her the manner so um, long story short it'll be a dc 15 um, charisma role and i have my silver tongue uh, expert skill which gives me advantage but sadly i do not have any bonuses because my charisma is only 11. so i'm going to roll 2d20 and i'm hoping for a 15. Yeah, look at this, 20, natural 20. <laughs> All right, so natural 20. So um, yeah, she she does not, um, her, her facial expression does not really change. So it is as if I'm looking into the face of a beautifully crafted statue, flawless appearance, glowing blue eyes, and, and long black shimmering hair and she just goes agreed 7500 it is then when can we leave and I'm like ooh, that was quick maybe I could have asked for more well uh, my ship is parked at docking bay 11 um, I, let me just finish my burger and uh, we can head right over there right away. Can't you take this burger to go? Oh, come on, I mean, you will have these 15 minutes. I mean, if I take it to go, it'll be cold. And, and, and the bun, it'll be, go, it'll be all greasy and stuff. Have you never had a good burger? I prefer ration bars. There I know what I'm getting. And they're completely adjusted to my bodily needs. <laughs> I bet they are, I go. So, <laughs> speaking of bodily needs, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> but that was just, I couldn't pass this one up. Um, yeah. All right, so um, yeah, I, I, I'll hurry. Um, yeah, do what you must, she goes. All right, and then I finish my burger and then we hit back or head back to my spaceship, docking bay 11. So we enter the docking bay 
and Raya. Uh, I, does she have herself? Uh, I don't know if she has introduced herself to me yet. So um, I I don't think she has. So so let's rewind a little back to the conversation on the table. And I'm like, so obviously you know a lot about me. You know my name. You know where to find me. And um, but I do not. I do know nothing about you. What is there you need to know? It's a simple job. Yeah, but a name would be nice. I mean, we will have to talk to each other a little eventually, and uh, it might be it might be good if I had a name. Raya. That's all she says. Raya. All right, Raya. Pleased to meet you. A pleasure. We'll see. Yeah, we will indeed. All right, and then um, I uh, finish, and then we head across or towards the, the docking bay. And while we are headed there, because it's late, so it was 2200 hours, then we talked. So let's say it is 2300 hours now. And this is a rough place. So I will roll a d6 to see if some form of, of random encounter appears or happens. And it is a 1 in 6. The usual 1 in 6. It's a 6, no. Um, for whatever reason, we arrive at the docking bay 11 um, without further incident. And then she catches a first glimpse of my beautiful ship, the versatile rust bucket, an old Corellian engineering YR-1080 light freighter in all his, its glory or her glory. Ships, I think, are female too. All right, so... Um, Let's let's say if she, uh, see if she if she reacts to it. I just roll and and her d20 will be purple, just like the color of her lightsaber, a uh, force blade. Excuse me. Uh, so um, one to ten, she makes a comment. Sixteen, she doesn't. So she looks at the ship, and I don't see any expression in her statue-like face. So we enter, and um, yeah, why don't you uh, strap yourself in, make yourself comfortable? Um, it'll take a while to get the engines warmed up and uh, exit the planet's gravity well, and then it'll take a while to to do these calculations. And um, it could, I mean. I need to see those coordinates first. So let me just get get into space, get outside the gravity well, and then um, you can get me these coordinates, and then we'll start calculations and go from there. You are the pilot. Um, you want me uh, to to show you to your cabin, or are you going to keep me company in the cockpit, which I would probably enjoy. I think I'll keep you company in the cockpit. Maybe I can pick up a thing or two in case you die on this mission and I have to fly this bucket back. Oh no, she doesn't say bucket, it's too emotional for her. Um, maybe I have to fly this ship back. All right, so if you've never flown a ship before and don't have proper pilot training, I doubt you'll be able to just by watching me, but I can show you how to operate the uh, autopilot. So that might assist you. But thanks for your confidence. Um, yeah, I usually don't think about the possibility of me dying and um, yeah, so, but of course, 
I would be pleased if you would join me in the cockpit. All right then. So we head towards the cockpit and we lift off and I calculate a course out of the planet's gravity well and those of you interested in Star Wars role playing and if you're also from the D6 area you probably know about the mechanics of hyperspace so gravitational fields a gravity well prevent hyperspace jumps this is what interdictor cruisers also use to intercept people they project gravity welds along hyperspace routes and every planet has like a, f a sphere of influence um, a gravity well that you have to get out of um, to be able to make a hyperspace jump so um, and and this journey out of the um, gravity well depending on security state of the system might be dangerous so this is where you might uh, fall prey to pirates slavers or whatever that lurk at the edge of the gravity well and try to attack approaching ships all right so let's see if if something like this happens on a roll of one it's a five no so there are a few ships on the scopes, but uh, nothing suspicious. No ship is heading towards me and no ship is uh, changing course or anything to intercept me. So I have a, a loose eye on the scope and we reach the edge of the gravity well. And now it is um, hyperspace calculation time. And um, I will determine that because this indeed takes long, it'll take 1d6 times 30 minutes for the calculations. So, and so in this time, there might also be another encounter. But first, um, I, need to, I need to see these coordinates now. Here they are. She just hands me over a data card. And I slide it into the um, universal data card reader and enter the coordinates into the nav computer and then i set up some parameters and make some calculations that i enter and then it is time for the computer to do its magic let's see so 1d6 times 30 That's, oh, that's a, that's a six. All right. So that's a six. That means three hours. So um, the co Navy computer, a, a timer starts popping up. So according, and, and I go, well, according to my pre-calculations and according to the values I entered, it'll take the Navy computer three hours to calculate a route to these coordinates from our current position and I need to cut the engines and hold position so that the calculations are precise and um, yeah and we we do not mess up that means <laughs> I look over to her and smile we have three hours to get to know each other and I I warn you um, I we probably will spend yeah, maybe one or two days together on this starship because yeah, of the fact that we need to calculate a completely new hyperspace route, which um, we can't travel as fast as we could travel along an established route. And let me check this real quick. I think it was a DC-15 check that I need to do. Let me pull up my Stardark document here for a minute. And bam, 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 Stardark, here it is. Uh, ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba. Travel times here. Hyperspace travel navigation calculating a new route requires a DC-15 intelligence check. All right, travel times are 2d6 hours longer than I would. And in case of a check, the chip does not enter hyperspace, a fail, but if you fail by more than five points or roll a critical failure, roll 1d6. 
if you roll a one your ship all right so this could end our adventure real quick so um dc 15 intelligence check i will do this check now i got an intelligence bonus of plus two thankfully um and oh i got my scoundrel's luck ability i got two luck tokens um because i'm starting with with two luck tokens and those blue tokens are luck tokens put them on my sheet and they replenish after a rest so if i fail i could use a luck token so dc 15 11 so i fail but not by five or more um the question is do i want to re-roll because I do not fail by five. That means the ship just does not enter hyperspace and I have to recalculate. If I re-roll and I'm unlucky, uh, I might yeah, end up with this whole ship blows up thing. And let's see. Um, Dreaded, if you fail, the ship does not enter hyperspace. But if you fail by more than five points or roll a critical failure, roll 1d6. Okay. So, and if you fail the check, you have to recalculate next round. So, and this, all right. So, um, I rather, this is of course meta knowledge now, but I rather not re-roll. I would have re-rolled if uh, failed by five or more because one in six chance, I don't like these odds, but so, um, I don't know this yet, but the calculations, um, they will be off and we will not enter hyperspace but first it is like three hours so let's see if an encounter happens during those three hours on a one no four all right so then it is um after three hours beep 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 beep, beep. Boop. all right damn what is it? She goes. It didn't work. We got to recalculate. It's there's a calculation error. And she goes like, what do you mean? You got to recalculate. We just waited here for three hours. Yeah, I know. I know. I told you flying through hyperspace ain't like dusting crops. It seems to me like your contacts over exaggerated when they praised your skill. Oh, well, maybe you want to try your hand at calculating a hyperspace route. I mean, you have just watched me. And according to you, that is probably enough to fly this ship by yourself in no time. So why don't I just um, relax and sit back? And let you handle the controls. Hmm. You don't need to get all riled up about it. I haven't thought about the human male ego to be so fragile. Go ahead. Do your thing. But if you would first show me to my cabin... And then you can get me shortly before these calculations are gone. Well, of course, my pleasure. So I show her to one of the passenger cabins I have on my ship. Nothing special, just a refresher unit, a bunk and um, a ration bar and water dispenser. Because like I got supplies for one month on the ship. This includes power, fuel, water. Uh, recyclabilities and stuff so and I figured they're like food dispensers and and stuff on in the cabin so she's got everything she needs even though it's not very luxurious all right so then get me when you're done and with that she closes the door hmm I don't know what to think of her, I go. And I head back to the cockpit and start recalculating. Uh, 
let's see, DC 15, and then I check the time. Oh, six plus two, that's eight, that's a reroll. I use my luck token. So this roll didn't happen, use my luck token. Yes, 19. <laughs> All right, so, and now the time. D6 times 30 minutes. Uh, but again, three hours. All right, so I rolled a 19, I think it was. So, uh, had to recalculate. DC 19, luck token used. Just for next time, okay. All right, so five minutes before, um, yeah, five minutes before this, the calculations are done, I head to her cabin, like in Star Trek. Oops, now I see, now I hit the, the thing, and she goes, I'll be out in a minute. And I'm like, calculations are done in five minutes. Looks good this time. We'll see about that. All right. And then I wait. And now, and I got to apologize. Of course, um, this is um, uh, <laughs> like the male gaze. Um, and then she got rid of her armor and she appears looking like this. And I'm like, Ugh. so um, the door opens and now she has shed those leaf-like plating structure of her armor that um, yeah, was fitted uh, over a, a bodysuit, basically. And she, she um, shed her robe or her hooded cloak. And now for the first time, I can actually see some sort of... of alien um alien physical appearance because as you can see she has slightly pointed ears and um yeah so um yeah of course you can see this so slightly pointed ears so i haven't noticed before so um she looked perfectly human even though of, of course um, there are a lot of near humans because of her um, glowing blue eyes but I um, but I figured um, yeah she probably is some sort of, of near human but these pointed ears um, so there's definitely something something alien about her but but I can't um, I can't stop looking at this fine-toned body and, and at her graceful movements and yeah it, she looks uh, pretty deadly <laughs> ice cold and deadly so she appears like this um in her cabin and goes then let's get into the cockpit and we head into the cockpit and um yeah Five minutes, all lights are green. All right, we got a route, we're good to go. And then I reach for the hyperspace levers and I pull them back and you see this characteristic stars, elongated lines and boom, off we go. And this is where I will end this first episode of this series. Not a lot of action, but it was important for me to to get this, to give this character introduction, um, the room and the time I think it needed and deserved. Also because they're actually, even though this is sort of like an NPC character, it's also a player character. So, um, so I think a, a more detailed introduction and description is in order. Yeah, so thank you for watching and um, yeah I hope you are uh, as excited about this series as I am and um, I'm um, excited to see how this goes and I'm 
really excited with this new setup that I have, but um, I'm not really, I don't like that I can really show stuff on a tablet without it reflecting all the time because I got some nice pictures prepared because I did pictures for like standard gameplay situations, alleyways, casinos, cantinas, and of course city plazas and I want to show them but if it's all reflecting, I got to see in the video how this looked because I can't see it while I'm filming real well. And if it's all right, um, yeah, I will just deal with the reflection. So those are my closing words. So as always, um, thanks for watching. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.